ready to go. Awesome. Party, break it down. Let's do this. All right, welcome to our fourth edition of 540.15. This is our weekly discussion on federal business opportunities, tech news, and various interesting articles we uh, tend to stumble upon uh, during the week. Uh, please follow us on Twitter at 540co, that's 540co. Uh, like our Facebook page, and please give us likes and retweets here on Meerkat and Paris. You've been watching too much Meerkat. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> So uh, I'm Jeremy Altman, and I'm here with uh, Patrick Nolan, and uh, today's episode is powered by the consumption of Red Bull. Uh, lots of caffeine here. Uh, so over the next 15 minutes, uh, we'd just like to uh, share with you some interesting topics that we've come across this week. Uh, so with the first topic, I'll throw it over to you, Patrick. All right, all right. So as many of you already know, but some of you don't hear new uh, to 540, we love the government and we also love tech. So uh, did a little investigation last night, didn't stay up too late looking at this stuff, but uh, tried to find some things on the web, um, some, new, some new tech that's going on within the government. Um, so what did I find? Uh, first off, USA.gov, they've got a brand new website, looks great, they're doing a facelift. It's currently in beta, but the, uh, the best part about this site is that they've got an API driven backend. So all the content uh, going to USA.gov is now going through the API, which um, I'm not sure. It, I think I read it. It is going to be publicly available. Um, it's either to I don't know if it's to the public or to actually uh, or to like partners such as like Facebook, to, um, who are going to like regurgitate the content. Gotcha. So um, I'm interested to track that to see if it is open, if we can um, you know suck it in and use it in one of our apps or something. Very cool. Also, uh, two other notes here. One trend that I've seen kind of going on right now in the government. Um, Kind of related to APIs, but more on the on the nerdy tech side of things is uh, voice to text, and this is interesting because I see a lot of it right now in like the smartphone world, um, different apps, voice voice to text. Maybe um, you know you want to create an email or something just straight from your phone. You don't have to text, uh, but this is cool because it's also being used by the government for um, you know numerous types of things. Uh, don't want to be uh, monitored here, but the NSA is uh, notorious for voice to text. Um, also DARPA. Uh, so some new some new cool tech projects going on there. Um, I'm wondering how APIs will be incorporated into voice to text. Maybe voice to text APIs that'd be sweet. Um, but basically, what it means is uh, they're taking your voice, converting it to text, which enables it to be searchable, um, and then we can we can find that content on the web. Um, then lastly, uh, one thing I work with a lot is uh, FOIA. So when we want data or we're not able to get data via APIs. A lot of times you have to request it, and you do this by um, by, by uh, filing a FOIA request. And what this does is it's just a formal request to get data across um, you know different government organizations at various levels of the government. And uh, one thing that is, is good and bad at the same time is that their um, FOIA is becoming more expensive for government agencies. Um, so they're regulating new policies and stuff that are going to actually um, cost. FOIA is going to cost more for government agencies. So I'm curious: is this going to um, to limit data sharing, or maybe this might promote APIs as well. Uh, hopefully, it will encourage university or universities and government agencies to build APIs so they don't that, so they don't have to have um, FOIA red, uh, restrictions and regulations. So I think that's a uh, very interesting and looking to hear a lot more from that. Um, and that's it for me in, in tech and government. So I'll pass it back over to you. Very cool. Uh, just real quick on that FOIA, um, was that starting with a specific agency? Um, um, yeah. So actually, I think it's. I don't know who actually governs the uh, FOIA, but um, I think right now it's DOJ, and so DOJ is doing like a, a policy and regulation reform on FOIA. So um, there's just a couple of new things that are being added there. Don't know the two, don't know the details of it. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, so one of the interesting topics that I came across was actually uh, an article that came out on May 6th, and it talks about how GitHub could be the next step for government regulation. Um, and the article talks about how the Office of Management and Budget actually uh, has recently published a suggested, suggested implementation guidance for the Federal IT Acquisition Reform Act. Um, and it goes on to talk about they actually put this up on GitHub and so they are requesting comments and then um, everyone else can actually provide their comments to this uh, regulation on GitHub. So. Uh, potentially could be a next step for how the government does business in, in regards to future uh, regulations. Um, it does state that you know not everyone 
you know, is willing to necessarily use GitHub or can easily use GitHub. So the Federal Register and stuff like that would uh, probably still be around um, in parallel. Um, so I just thought that was a little interesting, um, getting some good stuff with GitHub uh, and the government. That's awesome. Uh, I also found a little quick snippet as I was reading about GitHub. Okay, sure. Um, this is real brief, but uh, GitHub now supports, uh, what's it called, Jupyter Notebooks? Have you ever heard of those? I haven't heard of that. So either have I until last weekend, I did a, like a, a data web scraping class, mm -hmm. and we use Pyth or, um, uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And what it is, it's a, a web-based kind of interface to, to write different scripts and code. Okay. And it's used a lot in the, the data science, the mathematician world. Um, to help visualize and execute code to kind of in sequences as you go. Oh, very cool. Um, so GitHub supporting uh, academia, supporting the data science, that's all good. Um, expanding to the formats that they accept, so we're, GitHub's killing it right now. Awesome. <laughs> we love GitHub. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, so I guess I'll jump over to my next one? Yeah. Before, yeah. Before you, okay. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, one of my passions outside of the government is um, universities, so colleges and schools across the board. Um, supporting academia in terms of data as well as APIs. Um, so I kind of track this on the side, but one of, or actually two universities I found have some recent news as of late, um, both Harvard and Dartmouth. So I'll kind of touch briefly on what they're doing. Um, Harvard, I stumbled across this last night. Uh, it's really cool, um, really kind of aligned to, you know, one of my old projects actually from my senior thesis. Shout out to Mark over here. Uh, we, we built a university app and we used APIs to push in all the content. Um, but it's cool because Harvard has this program called Droid, and I was interested because I thought it was Android at first. I was like, oh, this is great. Everyone has iPhones. I'm lo loving the Android, but it's actually not. Um, what Droid stands for as an acronym is, bear with me, um, Digital Repository of Open Interesting Data. So this is a, a GitHub project. It's called Harvard Droid, and basically what it does is professors, alumni, staff, students, anyone who is involved with Harvard can contribute. And it's basically a big documentation effort where people say, hey, here's a cool data set, they can post it online and collect, and they're basically collecting everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've, um, they've built their APIs yet, but they're using GitHub as like a, a social platform to find out what data is available and what data is out there and what data they want to target. Gotcha. So um, really cool stuff. And so that, that repo right now is just restricted to Harvard or is it? It is, it's restricted, it's, no, so it's an open repo, mm -hmm. but um, the content is is all Harvard. All Harvard, okay. yeah. gotcha. Uh, and then lastly, this is kind of a uh, super nerdy, you know, we're all DIYers, we love um, Arduino and stuff like that, so I thought this was interesting. Uh, Dartmouth College recently upgraded their uh, athletic facilities, and with it they did a whole new LED lighting system, which is which is cool, LEDs, uh, best type of lights right now, I think. Um, but. The cool part about their new lighting system, it was for their, their football stadium, for their athletic complex, their weight room, um, everything to do with athletics, but the best part is that uh, there's, a, there's a system below that, there, excuse me, there's a, uh, like a control system that does all the light, turns them on and off, does schedule, um, accesses via profiles, but it's all API driven. So there's an underlying API for um, the actual light infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is interesting because that's a little different. Um, I think very shortly we'll see a lot of APIs that are that are tightly uh, coupled to hardware. Right. Uh, you know, IoT. I think that's going to be an exciting time for APIs. That's awesome. Very cool. And you said that was most of that was built off of Arduino's as well. Oh no, I just threw an Arduino oh, for just uh, in. for shizzing awesome. giggles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Um, so I've got one last topic. Um, this is an article that actually came out a, a few years ago, um, but uh, it, it's kind of a Kind of goes in line with some of the stuff that we've dealt with recently and it talks about how microsoft excel might be the most dangerous software on on the planet <laughs> <laughs> um so what what they mean by that and, and the article goes in to describe some of the financial industries using spreadsheets and uh, in particular one incident um one of the banks was using several different spreadsheets and, and different functions to calculate a uh, I think it was a value at risk um, uh, value, that about right? <laughs> yeah, um, just to see you know what their their risk was with uh, you know certain credit profiles. Um, so it turns out they were managing this and doing all these calculations with various different spreadsheets. Um, it was a very manual process, and they were you know copying and pasting from one spreadsheet to the other. It turns out on one of the the actual spreadsheets, the formula 
divided by the sum of a certain set of numbers instead of the average, which actually reduced that value at risk, which made them think that you know stuff was a little bit safer or, or less risky. Uh, that turned out to cost them billions of dollars. Um, <laughs> oh no. Yeah, so it's not funny. Why right, am I laughing? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it, it's a big deal. Um, you know, maybe not certain banks a billion may not be that much, but you know, to us, obviously, that's a that's a huge amount of money. Um, so it, it just goes on to say, you know, manual processes, manual spreadsheets, where you know you have a workflow process where certain P's might be to um, you know control stuff with spreadsheets or any manual process, not necessarily spreadsheets. Uh, could be somewhat dangerous, you know, maybe try to do some more automation and validation of, uh, of the process. Um, it does want, go on to say that, you know, Excel is a very powerful tool and the, you know, the financial industry would not be what it is today without the use of Excel and spreadsheets. Um, but we do need to be a little bit careful of, of how we use tools like that, um, you know, in, in some of the more automated uh, processes that we use. Um, so th I think that wraps it up for my topics. Uh, do you have anything else for us today, Patrick? Yeah, I've got uh, one more thing, but um, you know, we can talk about Excel a little bit more. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Excel was my first real interactive tool with data, right? Uh, if I had a data set, Excel was the, the place to go, right. when, especially when I was younger, you know, um, and you don't have that, that, that technical experience. Um, so it's interesting, right? Because Excel is a tool for a lot of people who don't have technical skills um, because you can get semi-technical and write formulas, perform mathematical calculations um, in a simple app, right? That's Absolutely. on basically all machines. Right. Um, it is tricky though because Excel can get very complex. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And you can also embed ser uh, powerful functions like uh, you know formulas or even code into right. Excel. Right. Um, you know, one thing I always check is like, do you have enabled content? Is there like some type of script in the back end? Absolutely. Uh, you know, from a security perspective, you can almost like inject some code into an Excel spreadsheet and then send it over to somebody and then right. could run on their machine, which sure. is kind of scary. Um, but you know, Excel is good, a good tool. Um, overall, I think it it will slowly start to go away. I don't think we'll ever get rid of it. Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah. no and, and, and like the, the article mentioned, I mean, Excel is very powerful and it definitely has its place, you know, as, as one of the tools that we use. Um, I, I think it is something that we have to be a little conscious about if if we allow input from you know spreadsheets um, that spreadsheet when when you give it to someone else you know it, like in this case the uh, the formula was wrong um, it could be modified by someone else and so when you get that data back uh, there's still some validation that you have to do to, to make sure that that everything aligns with with what you expect so uh, just something to be you know aware of um, so if we no put it, that. so we'll just lock down the Excel spreadsheet and SharePoint, then we're good to go. Uh, maybe. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, so on to on to cooler tech other than SharePoint and Excel. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about some some new things going on in the social world. Uh, you know, we love Meerkat, and what do we love even more than Meerkat? The Meerkat like API. Like some retweets, please. Like some <laughs> yeah. retweets. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Meerkat released their API last week. Very cool. Or maybe Meerkat. last week, sometime in the in the in the, uh, the 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 past couple of weeks. Gotcha. Um, so I got a API key. Everyone else should have here. Uh, so I mean, what are we going to build on this uh, Meerkat API? We can we should do some type of analytics or some type of visualization. Um, I saw Meerkat. They actually the people of Meerkat asked that somebody build a, a map visualization on you know where people are streaming, how many people are going different locations, what's the most popular location. So uh, I think there's an, it's an exciting time for Meerkat because this differentiates them from Periscope. Uh, so, you know, they're trying to make a difference. They're trying to open up to the public, um, expose that. And then, you know, kind of like, if, or kind of like the Meerkat streams, it enables people to build new apps. Um, so, you know, does an app replace Meerkat? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it comes, becomes an API. That'd be cool. Um, we'll see. Very cool. Yep. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, tune in again next Wednesday, 7 a.m., same place, uh, for the next edition of 540.15. Thanks, have a great week. Thanks, guys. Bring that music on.